Pan 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 Psychast. Part two, the prince. So before we jump into Machiavelli's The Prince, we have a short little advertisement here from Gaston Lugo Backpacks. I've been rocking my black and brown classique for the last few months. I've absolutely loved it. But before we decide to advertise the backpack on the show, I decided that it would be best if we only advertise products that are ethically sourced from here we always do this anyway where we try our best to all of our merchandise we've done before is ethically sourced and i think we should carry on in the same spirit so making sure that we're only doing you the best service i spoke to yolanda and i'm going to read a confidential email between me and yolanda here um when i asked her i said yolanda love the backpack looks great but we're only going to advertise them if you can reach our ethical standards and yolanda said our backpacks are assembled from strong resistant fabrics such as cotton canvas and metal buckles we don't use any animal products all parts that look leather are made from synthetic alternatives we strive for perfection in everything we do while also taking care of our environment we are also committed to lowering our carbon footprint by using the most offensive offensive no effective (laughs) transportation alternatives Uh, gas and luca uh, trucks are not offensive in any way they're quite the opposite um, designed to be uh, have a low carbon footprint i've absolutely loved my backpack and again i will say it again it's an honor to be sponsored by gas and luca because it's great it's a beautiful backpack and you guys are going to get the chance to win one at the end of the episode any thoughts on gas and luca before we jump into the prints i just uh, i always like to support businesses that are are ethical and and therefore it's just nice for us to actually when we do advertisements that we're doing it for a company that i can actually respect and to actually wish that people do check out so uh, please do uh, even if you just look at the store you might see something that you find interesting It'd be a bit weird if we spoke about ethics as much as we do and we didn't support ethical companies um, so yes well done to those companies that are being ethical and we're going to try uh, and encourage our listeners to be as ethical with their purchases as possible gastonluga.com use the discount code pansai for 15% off all items their backpacks even come with a free passport holder for that trip to florence you might be taking at the end of the year to visit machiavelli's farm (laughs) (laughs) Uh, where are we going from here i like that so before we jump into the prints i guess we give the context talk about the letter at the start things like this yeah so when we talk about the prints this is a book which has a very interesting reputation and when i say interesting i think i'm just gonna say with bad (laughs) um it's got a bit of a bad reputation especially historically so i'm gonna start with a quote from cardinal reginald pole who was an english cardinal in 1538 about the prince he said the following i had scarcely began to read the book when i recognized the finger of satan though it bore a human name, an author, and was written in a discernibly human style. Um, And he goes on to say, It is the aim of this doctrine to act like a drug that causes princes to go mad, making them attack their own people with the savagery of a lion and the wiles of a fox. Pretty damning stuff. I mentioned last time Bertrand Russell calls it a handbook for gangsters. Strauss says that um, it's the... Machiavelli's the teacher of evil. So this is... You know, these aren't very generous readings, are they? They're quite mean-spirited. Then we're going to figure out whether or not they are or not. That's kind of our inquiry question. I know I've become a worse person having read the book. <laughs> well, you're not doing a good job by telling us that, I don't think. You didn't read the book properly, but you're just like, yeah, I lie all the time and I'm horrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, although I think I was doing that before the book. So this is just an excuse now. This is fun. Um, <laughs> Let's get into it. The letter uh, at the start? Yeah, so just just a bit of context here. Uh, as we've already said in part one, Machiavelli starts writing this uh, and the discourses on Livy, uh, as well as other things, after he has been removed from the Republic and the Medici are back in power. And this is this book is often seen as his kind of his shot at, at trying to get back into favor and being part of the, the ruling class again. Mm. Uh, and so it's kind of like a, a CV or at least a, like an application, right, to, to see if he can win over the, the favor of the Medici. And so when the first thing you'll notice is that before chapter one, uh, there is actually like a dedication to Lorenzo de Medici, the Magnificent. Now, that is not to be confused 
with Lorenzo Medici, the magnificent, the actual magnificent, <laughs> which was uh, this guy's <laughs> grandfather. So like he's kind of appealing to this this young new Medici ruler saying mm. like, you know, you're just like your famous, awesome granddad uh, and you're not really that great, but I'm going to kind of fluff it up for you and make, make you sound real great. So he, he opens with like this, this kind of dedication to mm. him and the purpose of it. It's probably worth, I guess, just reading the, maybe the first tiny little bits, yeah, I guess right. um, just so that we, we can kind of get a flavor for it. So it opens, usually uh, those who wish to gain the favor of a prince approach him with those things which they themselves hold most dear or which they have seen delight him most. And so we frequently find princes presented with horses, arms, uh, cloth of gold, precious stones and similar ornaments worthy of their dignity. I therefore now that I wish to present your excellency with some token of my service to you. I have found nothing among my possessions which is more dear to me and which I value more than an understanding of the actions of great men acquired by me from a long experience of current affairs and the assiduous study of the ancients. And it is this deeply considered and examined over a long period of time and now condensed into one small volume which mm. I send to your excellency." So he's basically selling, like, you know, I can't offer you riches and gold and all of this stuff. What I can offer you is, like, a really great study of what's worked for rulers in the past, what's worked recently, and uh, this is all for you in this one small little book. Yeah, it's a gift. It's a gift of his knowledge, his skill. Mm. I think it's quite interesting as well, just kind of thinking about that, that he tries also later on in that introduction to be like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm mm. not telling you what to do. I'm not, I'm not the expert per se. Like, you're the expert, man. Like, you're in charge. But... If you just want to have a little look at history, this is what history says. Um, so there's quite like a, a, a somewhat amusing tone of like he, he kind of doesn't want to say I'm not the authority on this. But yeah. if you just need a little bit of advice, this is a this is a, a little handbook to, to read through. Yeah, he, he says that like, you know, a great artist, if they want to paint a landscape, have to like stand under the landscape, mm. you know, to be beneath to, to be able to observe it properly. And so he kind of appeals to that. Right. He says, like, I myself am not a great man like yourself, yeah. uh, but I can give you this objective eye from the outside uh and give it give you that point of view which is like obviously very valuable because you might not be able to see your own flaws because you're so close to them so he's describing lorenzo as essentially being on these lofty peaks while he's down there on the ground i think a nice insight into the purpose of it outside of the letter um, which he dedicates and which is in the front of all our additions to lorenzo is letters he wrote to um, his friend Vittori at the time, saying he gave him a very early copy of it. And he writes in the letter to Vittori that he wants to, quote, make himself useful to our Medici lords, even if they begin by making me roll the stone. Yes, this is a gift, but it's also a job application. He's trying to win their favour. He loves working in office as a diplomat. He misses that in his exile. And this is alongside lots of other letters of essentially pleading that he can get this job back. So he thinks this is his best chance, give them the most valuable thing possible. And it was most likely that Lorenzo never read it. Mm. Um, so it was given as a gift in 1515, I do believe. Um, there's no evidence that he that, that Lorenzo read it at all. Um, it wasn't actually, the, the book itself wasn't actually published, like we mentioned in part one, until afterwards in about 1532 as well. So it's kind of kind of stuck on a shelf, really, for a few years until after Machiavelli's death. Mm. So this isn't like a, like a book that was published and people knew who he was and stuff like that. It wasn't really widespread and didn't get the notoriety until, uh, you know, a few decades after his death, really. So that's kind of worth knowing as well. This is literally an edition given to Lorenzo, and then was later published uh, afterwards. So there are some copies in circulation in the 1520s, but these are very few and far between. It only really gains traction uh, when it's published officially. And this is the time of the printing press. Like, this is why it's one of the very early texts that uh, lots of people can get their hands on across Europe. So it's in this letter as well, Machiavelli says, I've not embellished or crammed this book around periods or big impressive words of the kind which many in the habit of doing to describe or adorn what they have produced. And I think that's a great uh, way of saying that in Machiavelli's own words, that this book is accessible and people, and we do highly recommend you pick it up because it is very short and well worth reading. Um, should we talk about the, I guess, the structure of the book and, and how it's laid out? Yeah, so the uh, we mentioned this before, but the this book is not necessarily strictly a, like a philosophical text. I'd say this the the last part of it is certainly more philosophical. The first part, so it's broken down really into kind of two big sections. But I, I've kind of like to think of it as three bits with like two big bits uh, with a little bit in the middle. Chapter one to eleven is all about types of principality, um, and just I don't think we've actually said this yet. But when we use the term prince, we don't mean it in the way in which most people today will think. It's literally Purple just, rain. 
<laughs> yeah, it, like that's what I just... think about when I think of Prince. <laughs> so, yeah, they, you could, might think of the pop star, uh, but you might also think of like just you know royalty as such. But it's it really Maybe. when we're talking about here, we're just talking about kind of a leader of a state, right? Uh, and and but as opposed to a say a republic, yeah, not a um, noble birth kind yeah. of prince, yeah. Good. Um, and so, yeah, chapter one to 11 is different types of principality and and kind of which ones work, which ones don't. The little bit in the middle that I mentioned is kind of about the military and why that's important. Uh, and then the last bit, so chapter 15 to 26 or 25, really, is kind of how how should princes conduct themselves so that's why i would say that's a bit more uh, i mean machiavelli often gets talked about as being like an amoralist but i mm. still say there is some sense of morality in those sections that we'll dissect and then the last bit um kind of just going back almost to, to the, what the opening bit was about this letter to the medicis it's like a call to the medici to say all right now you've read all of these things that i've said it's time for you to to kind of take notice and try and uh, unite italy to be this great nation again mm. So the whole thing is kind of yes, hire me for the, for this position, but also kind of this nationalist, uh, like proud of the Italian uh, or what the Italian state could be if it if only it had the right people to to lead it. And this first section, when he's talking about the different types of principalities, is probably a good starting point, isn't it? Which mm -hmm. is is quite propositional in just offering advice to how a new prince should rule. This is not a guide for, I guess, a, a well-established prince. Uh, you could find some value in it, but it's more of if you're a new prince of the game, what are the key things that you need to do to secure yourself power and honor as well? So it starts off with lots of different types of advice. The first thing I want to mention is that he says, quote, uh, all the states have either been republics or principalities. I shall leave out discussion of republics here. Uh, his book, Dis uh, Discourses on Livy, is all about republics. Uh, I want to talk about that in part four, so you've got a while to wait for that. Um, so he and we are just going to be focusing on principalities here. Should we unpack some of the basic advice that he gives to new princes and how they can secure themselves initially um, with a bit? What are the good foundations for a prince who is going to rule over a state? Yeah. So and just to be clear here, because like from the get go, he says there are two major types of principality. There are like new principalities and there are ones that are kind of additions to an already like known state. So mm. maybe like you conquer a new place and you're the prince of that now, or you're like a her hereditary principality, in which case he kind of doesn't bother talking about particularly that last one because he doesn't think that it's really hard to rule right like yeah. like you already have the respect of the people that the, basically all you have to do is not get gout and, <laughs> <laughs> and not waste all the people's money like and okay. then like as long as you keep some favor and you throw a few festivals all's well and good um so really what we're focused on for this like these chapters are like new principalities so you've just got power how are you going to organize things and keep hold of it? Should we say the first thing on, so say I've got a state and I merge it like with a new state. I'm a, I'm a new prince and I'm adding it on perhaps to uh, an old principality, which I've got as well. A uh, nice quote here. For the rest, so long as their old ways of life are undisturbed, men live quietly. Although there is some divergence in language, nonetheless, their customs are similar and they can easily get along. Um, and he's saying that the old family of the prince should be destroyed, they should be killed. And one of the most ex most best, most effective expedients would be for the conqueror to go and live there in person. And that's those are some of the key central bits of advice, aren't they? Do not change the constitution or the laws and don't especially change their taxes when you take over somebody else's territory. It might be handy to go and live there so you can smell the problems nice and early on and deal with them there and then. Yeah, I think the main message for me for the first few pages was try not to change too much at the start. But he also said to kill lots of people at the start as well. <laughs> yeah, there's this kind of this, this sense I get from reading the first few chapters of The Prince is that Machiavelli's worried that some new princes may just invade somewhere, have this new territory, and then just not know what to do with it. Um, and therefore, what will probably happen is that the people of that territory will revolt, and then that causes issues for the prince. So what kind of things does he recommend? Well, like Jack said, he says you living in that territory itself helps solve a lot of those issues. That's very, very important. He kind of mentions as well that having military garrisons there of foreign armies isn't a good thing. That actually encourages people to revolt. Um, he kind of doesn't like that. He says you should put, instead you should probably like establish colonies in that territory. They're cheaper um, and provide kind of loss, less hostility. And there's a really great bit I just want to reference in the third chapter, which kind of sums up this kind of idea. Affairs of the state are like tuberculosis. In its early stages, it's easy to cure, 
and hard to diagnose. But if you don't spot it and treat it, as time goes by, it gets easy to diagnose, but not hard to cure. So this idea that if you're living in this territory, if you're identifying these issues quickly and dealing with them, they won't become big problems. But if you ignore them, they will become big, big problems that you probably aren't going to be able to solve. So already you've kind of got this kind of very pragmatic, practical approach to having new territory. Mm. Um, and this is something that's probably to the modern ears, you're like, well, yeah, that's practical, that's modern. But actually at the time, uh, Machiavelli is quite unique in that essence because this this new humanism we've been talking about, this kind of focusing on the practical of the logistics of ruling, was very at odds with, guess I guess, how the papacy would do it um, and how a lot of people had done it before where it was uh, looking at kind of ideals and like the theology of it and mm. like what was the ethical good thing to do from like either a Christian perspective or from the, the papacy's perspective. Machiavelli says kind of scrap that. It's just all about the practical, realistic essence of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, in this case, you know, running a new territory. Yeah. And just just a couple of those practicalities then. I and mean, we mentioned a couple of them. Um, but he he says, like, yeah, I, ideally, wipe out anybody you see as an immediate threat as quickly as you can. Um, and also to to ally with weaker possible allies, so, because like they will hopefully like, you'll gain their favor and they might give you give you things in return and support in the long run. Whereas if you try to ally with already quite strong either principalities or republics or whatever, you might find that they will use their power against you. So like it's kind of like play the numbers game and be aware of the fact that like don't don't try to take too much um away from the powerful uh, because you know that that's not going to hold you well as a new prince. Mm. So it, and there's that it's, it's trying to leave things as they are, aren't, aren't they? And there's, yeah. there's there's another level here where um so we've got it says some at page 17 in my edition in the Penguin Books Great Ideas. Um, he's saying that in, in states governed by the prince and his servants, and when there's no other special people around, the prince will be loved most. So make sure you are like unrivaled in your position. And just a last point before we move on from like you're in it, you take over. What's the first things that you do? And it, there's a really powerful quote where he says, there is nothing more difficult than initiating changes in a state's constitution. The innovator makes enemies of all those who prospered under the old order and only lukewarm support in forthcoming from those who would prosper under the new. In a consequence, whenever those who oppose the changes can do so, they act vigorously and the defense by the others is only lukewarm. Urgently arrange the matters, the first thing, so that... If people aren't happy with the order or you taking control, they can be done so by force. So the first thing to do is establish um, some kind of army. And we'll talk about that in a moment, what kind of army that's going to be. Make sure that the old prince and the old people who are ruling are dead, but keep those the citizens and the aristocracy as well, the aristocrats, those in wealth, those higher up in society. Make sure that they're also in a happy position because they're the ones with the money. They can... In, and in the discourses to mention it, he mentioned this is one of the greatest risks to a republic is that money can lose your uh, your form of government. Yeah, he, he's thinking long term, isn't he? he he's, he's, he's worried that, you know, whether it's Lorenzo or you know, a hypothetical person reading this book, if they if they find themselves in command of new territory, that they're only going to think short term solutions to problems. And then there's going to be long term issues from that. So he's trying to give perspective you know, he's trying to say you need to think more long term than the immediate just, oh, I've conquered this territory and now this territory is mine and it will be mine forever. You know, you need to kind of like pragmatically find the problems and fix them and cure them, whether that's money or rebellion. You know, he mentions that there could be rebellion from within. There could be attack from outside. You kind of need to be prepared for all different kind of um, eventualities um, and that being prepared for that will make it easier to deal with really interesting part i think from i know it's kind of jumping ahead a little bit but in in kind of chapter seven even though it's quite a short chapter he kind of just says straight up that you've got to be a talented ruler and you've got to work immediately hmm. to defend what luck has brought your way so the idea that you can't just kind of go yeah oh, you know what like that, that was a difficult conquest i'm just gonna sit back in my castle with my boots on and everything's fine and stroke my dog have a nice cup of tea uh, you've got to be active and not mm. passive he uses lots of historical examples in in the prince um, he definitely shows off his his wide amount of reading on all the different historical examples and you know and he says that like you know the root the, the princes the rulers that last that have their dynasties are the ones that are active and act immediately they don't just kind of like hang around and enjoy yeah. the glory of the spoils of their conquest yeah and just uh you mentioned historical examples i mean there are so many there's no way we're going to reference all of them um but on in chapter three where 
we were just going back to that point he actually he lists a couple of people but he says uh, like louis the 12th and their uh, and the french's attempt to kind of invade italy failed because of the like he didn't do the things that we were talking about mm. previously so he says louis had made five mistakes he had eliminated the lesser powers he'd given more power in italy to one who was already powerful as he said like he didn't he didn't favor the, like the weaker people he gave it to the people who might be able to challenge him uh, he introduced into that country a very powerful foreigner he had not made his home there he had not introduced any colonies into that country right so like he he's pointing he's making these examples of things that you should do and actually saying like here's a guy who didn't do it yeah. and it failed miserably so maybe you want to do the opposite to him which is great right like he's he's not just saying these things and saying wouldn't this be nice he's saying like no i've seen it happen and mm. it, like and if you don't do these things you're bound to fail he also mentions as well, and this is important to say, that it's not just kind of the people, we've kind of mentioned in inverted commas so far, but actually winning the support of the nobles and the barons of these certain areas. Mm. And he says that there's a very delicate balance between, you know, you should be suspicious of the nobles that kind of just follow what you say straight away because you need to kind of question their motives. Are they just following mm. you because it's the most convenient? Are they Have they got their own uh, somewhat Machiavellian reasons for doing that? But you've also got to crush any ones that immediately, you know... Um, challenge you and although i've just kind of used that language to you know crush someone who challenges you um one of the themes of the prince uh, that i'm sure we'll come back to many times because it is in multiple chapters is this idea of you shouldn't necessarily always be a good person well that, i guess that's the meat of it isn't it but we kind of have this drip fed to us up until chapter 15 and the first real instance of it i saw and when we were mentioning about uh, cruelty and violence quote violence must be inflicted once for all people will then forget what it tastes like and so be less resentful if you drip feed and if you crawl and if you kill somebody every other month and you try and layer it out people will always think of you as this tyrant this evil dictator but if you just kill everyone at the start who you need to and then try and bring about uh, you, you're rewarding your citizens you're putting on festivals for them you, you sh you're living there like these are the kind of things to win them back on favor you, you're not going to win them favor if you're continually evil to them throughout your reign yeah quote from chapter eight so cruelty well used is short and decisive no more than is necessary to secure your position and then benefit your subjects mm. so he's not saying you know what you when you feel like it just kill anyone who rebels he's actually saying no actually if you're not kind of cruel to start with you're going to get rebellion so be cruel probably be a bit more cruel than you would be or want to be um, and if you do that, then you probably will have less problems. And then you can be, um, you know, the, the the leader that is loved and kind of well thought of by the people. Um, but just like Jack said, yeah, if you kind of just push down people as they rise, that's probably not going to be the way that he thinks would, would lead to a, a good state. Yeah. And uh, another example from... For, this comes from chapter eight whose title is uh, those who, uh, who have gained principalities through wickedness uh, he, he highlights how dangerous it is to going back to this kind of notion of what it means to be machiavellian never mistake this never think that like oh it just means that you should be cruel uh, just because you can um, and, he, and he highlights uh, agothocles uh, the sicilian who like rose to power he came from like quite a low standing background mm. uh, he became the like, military commander in syracuse and then was just absolutely brutal and was not favored <laughs> really at all and it's like right okay so sure he was really harsh um but like what did that really gain this is an example of one of the things he he did uh, as an example of cruelty so he, he brought a bunch of people together in the senate in syracuse and then uh, basically in true <laughs> machiavellian style as it were he just had the, all the senators and the rich people killed so I think we should labor this point for a while because I think this is the most, for me, this is the most significant passage throughout The Prince and it comes really early on, probably a third into the book, in the criteria or the goal for what The Prince should be trying to do. Uh, a, a quote just below the one Andy gave, uh, yet it cannot be called prowess to kill fellow citizens, to betray friends, to be treacherous, pitiless, irreligious. These ways can win a prince power, but not glory. So here's a bit of that moral fiber that often gets overlooked in the prince. The goal is power and glory. That's what a prince should be doing. So when we use the phrase Machiavellian from the prince, I think we have to say that someone is Machiavellian or acting like Machiavelli's prince is one that pursues power and glory for themselves. So if you're acting with too much, causing too much harm, and you're running kind of like more of an evil dictator and, you, and you're acting like uh, the Sicilian's often were i mean 
the, the, some of the worst uh, what's tyrants before. I think his Agathocles's predecessor, I believe, went into a town or a city, put every man, woman, and child into a catapult and flung them into the river and allowed them all to drown. And the he, the same man had like an like a, what was it? It's like a bull, which was an oven, and he would in front of everyone put people in this big bronze bull, uh, set put fire underneath it, but leave holes coming out the the horns of it, so you could hear them scream. And this was, and we'll talk about Machiavelli's idea of being feared and not loved later on. But Machiavelli's saying, if you do those things, you're not being a good prince. So I think that's a really strong example for it's not just power that you want, as often people read the prince and think, it's also power and glory. So you can't just, like, uh, you can't act like one of the um, the great dictators in history. You can't act like uh, Kim Jong-un. You can't be Hitler. You can't be Stalin. They didn't get glory. They just got power. And even that didn't last. Even well, one of them still yeah, the, the, sorry, Kim. Yeah, the, <laughs> the difference between success and glory there, uh, and I think that is important. So, if if someone like Agathocles is an example of how not to do it, so just sheer outright inhumanity. Um, we've already mentioned him in the introduction, but we haven't mentioned him in this section yet, which is Cesare Borgia, right? He 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 is seen as the person who kind of toes that line and and does it in the right way. Uh, we were, we also said about kind of this swiftness that you would need to to make sure that things do go your way and uh we're not going to go through his whole bio again but just to remind you slightly the son of alexander the sixth he's given he's given an army to try and conquer the romania and he does this very quickly and i, I, I use the example of uh, romero di orco where he's he basically hires this guy who's really horrible everyone hates him uh, but then he makes an example of romero by cutting him in half right and yeah okay so ultimately horrible and cruel mm. how does that differ to Agathocles? well because he does it like astutely he doesn't do it just for the sake of the violence he uses it as a control mechanism to kind of create the like the right amount of fear and also to like gain favor because this guy was horrible to the people in the romania and he's just now shown like hey i got rid of the guy you hated and so it's like this smart way of being cruel which he is supporting here as long as it's so you can be cruel you can use violence and that's definitely advocated in the prince but you can never let that overstep the mark where your reputation is at risk and that ties into another instrumental part of machiavelli's ideas in the prince that the best protection you have is the people is the people loving you i think he refers to it to the the most fortified castle one can have yeah um next to having a non-mercenary army and making sure that you arm the people, <laughs> which he loves the idea of. And he gives this great example of David fighting Goliath and how Saul offers uh, David his armor. And he quote, armor belonging to someone else drops off you or weighs you down or is too tight. If you employ mercenaries, they're going to, you're going to owe them something and they're going to try and take things from themselves. They won the battle for you. They're not loyal to you. And they might run away at the first sight of danger, which ironically... Um, the actual standing army of Florence <laughs> yeah. did under Machiavelli's uh, control. Uh, the, one, the one thing I wanted to pick up on that is that like, I just love the little embellishment he gives to that story as well, because he says that like, David goes in with a slingshot and a dagger. So like, yeah. he's like, just in case, just in case, <laughs> just, yeah. just in case the little slingshot doesn't work on the line. <laughs> I've got my dagger here as well. But it's a nice little way, I think, as well. Like, I think, sorry to break away, very briefly break away from the prince. This kind of, I, I thought as well that think about that quote literally imagine using somebody else's notes or teaching somebody else's lessons or powerpoints or taking somebody else's ideas and trying to do them yourself like it just doesn't feel as as raw and you don't you're not as passionate about it as much as if you were to do it like grassroots yourself do you get that feeling yeah well and and you just wouldn't you wouldn't feel completely in control of it, right? Yeah. Like, like, say if you were using somebody else's resources for something, like if you'd glanced at it, you're not going to be nearly as prepared as, as if you've planned it all out yourself rigorously and you know where it's going to go. And that, like, and that's that's a very significant part of the prince, planning, knowing mm. knowing your territory, knowing your troops, knowing your enemy, knowing yourself. Yeah. Uh, like, you can't, you have to be intelligent for yeah. this to work. And, and knowing your limits is a really important part of it as well. Like, you know, this idea that you need to be reserved and not overstressed stretch yeah. not try and conquer all the territory you know uh, be realistic and pragmatic about it 100 percent. and it's also tying it this standing army i think a real fundamental building block here and all that advice to summarize the first third of the book for me was the most important thing is that one the people love you and two the people rely on you 
And if you've got these two things, you'll have a standing army, you'll have their support, and they're not going to try and usurp you with somebody else. One, one thing I really find quite interesting as well about the first third of this book is how irreligious it is mm -hmm. when it talks about ruling. So obviously, you know, we're living in a time of, you know, um, pretty much everybody in Italy at this time is Christian. Um, you know, we've got one of the most powerful um, you know, popes in charge. We've got, you know, the Pope has his own army, um, an immeasurable amount of political influence. Um, and there is certain times where he mentions kind of church states and how kind of there's the only form of government that's kind of secure and relaxed as opposed to other types. Mm. But apart from that, I mean, I think one of the reasons why it was so controversial is there is a distinct lack of Christian ethics in this book in terms of how you should behave. Um, like like I said earlier, it's just the kind of this pragmatic approach seems very at odds with um, the the religious side of it. Um, there's barely any mention of you know uh, fighting for God or fighting for what God wants or what the papacy wants. It's definitely in the the self interest of of the prince himself. You're quite right in that like, sense that he doesn't appeal to any anything like religious as far as like how how you should rule. Although chapter eleven is ecclesiastical principalities yeah, one, and. Um, and so, but like he's he's quite, he says that like again they're like one of the easiest things to rule. Yeah. Um, so he says uh, they're acquired either by uh, with skill or good luck. They are kept without either of those qualities. This is because they are sustained by the age old institutions of religion, which are so strong and of such a nature that they keep their pri uh, princes in power, whatever actions or however they live. So like, hey, that's and, and, all... and that's why like he appeals to people like Pope Julius or Alexander, where it's like these people were really horrible. Horrible. Yeah. They conquered a bunch of stuff, and everyone loved them anyway. Um, and so, like, <laughs> like you can't lose unless, again, like I guess you're if you are become incredibly hated, and that's like the hardest thing to do if you're the Pope. I think the, it, the mixture of both your ideas here is that he there's a he does mention it. He says it's like a great thing to have, but there's a lack of like religious Christian ethics and content there as well. He's saying uh, I should not argue like he's concerning whether or not higher powers exist and there is a divine right of kings. He says I should not argue about them. They're exalted and maintained by God, and only a ras and presumptuous man would do this. And it reminded me of uh, episode 36 we did of the podcast uh, where the philosopher of mine Daniel Dennett when talking about this. Uh, something rang true um he said now it's been used by so he's talking about religion here his views on religion now it's been put by leaders priests kings tribal leaders because it's a great idea you can pass the book to the man upstairs and say don't take it from me that's what god thought the thing is that people don't have to understand they don't have to be machiavellian it's just that they have to get something into their head that they've got god's help so dan dennett there and i guess machiavelli saying as well that like this, like you don't need this advice really if you like are taking over an ecclesiastical office as, as a as a prince. Like you can really do what you like in the name of God. Yeah, just the last thing on religion uh, in this section is that let, let's just be clear here, right? That while Machiavelli certainly wasn't classically religious in any way, uh, he thought that religion was really important for the prince to to actually support and to uh, and actually encourage. He thought that basically countries or states without religion showed greater signs of disruption and immorality and would be harder to rule. Um, and so in which case, even if you're like the prince themselves kind of just pays lip service to God, uh, they really have to make it look like they care about this stuff and the religious institutions and festivals and stuff are a big deal and that you should take notice. There's a, there's a great quote from page 52 of the discourses, which I think he can also be applied to his ideas of a principality where he says, there can be no greater indication of the ruin of a state than to see a disregard for its divine worship. He essentially says you can predict whether or not a state, a principality or a republic is going to last by how many people are turning up to church. Because yeah. without God, there's no morality to hang it on. Uh, yeah, and, and the just even at this time, there would have been the association that good, in inverted commas, means religious. Like to be a good person would be to be a religious person. Um, you know, there wasn't uh, you know that much variety, I guess, in terms of people's beliefs. It was kind of good Christian or maybe not, not so good Christian <laughs> um, or, or, or atheist. So I mentioned that we're tying in this idea of, of uh, I mentioned the discourses on Levy earlier on, and we're also talking about this idea of God and its place within the prince. A great quote from Levy, you think uh, basically Machiavelli loosely quotes himself as fortune favors the brave. And there's this deep idea of fortuna within the prince that 
you know, fortune needs to be on your side. Um, and he does this through a great discussion in the book about God and how perhaps that we are determined. And if we are determined, is it all down to just luck and chance? And can we really change the course of our lives? And think about that idea of course. Imagine you're on the seas and the winds of fortune blow. Machiavelli says you have to get your sails ready for that. And he t talks about fortune in a, I guess, as a feminine thing and talks of, and we're going to talk about this idea of virtue in a moment, but how it, it talks about it like a little bit, I don't want to say, um, like erotically, a quote from him here, he says, fortune is a woman and if you want to control her, it is necessary to treat her roughly. She's more inclined to yield to men who do so. Yeah, so there's that idea of impetuosity of kind of like, people with vitality and like, so like, these young men who go out and conquer uh, yeah, some of the ways in which perhaps that you could rely on fortune too much so uh, could be like in, in chapter nine where it mentions civil principalities uh, and how like you you get these through the support of either the people or the nobles, right? Mm. And like if you relied on the nobles for your for your power, you are in a lot of trouble because he says that ultimately nobles are people who might see themselves as being equal to the prince uh, or at least close to, and that they're the, most likely the people who are going to plot against you. Yeah. And so if you owe a lot of these powerful rich people favors, beware. And and that's that's an important thing, right? So like if you get into the power like that, you're riding that wave of fortune and it's until those rich powerful people have had enough and then suddenly you 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 know, your good luck is is over. So always have the power of the people so that and you mentioned that idea like the people are the best fortress, right? Mm. Like if you have their support, then even if like there's a noble who knows your true intentions, knows how, that you're actually a bit wicked, the, po the the masses don't get to see that right. and they will they will have your back regardless and no no noble wants to have you assassinated conspire against you only then to be like killed by the public right and you can see that in the patsy conspiracy that we mentioned uh in the in the first uh, episode right if you fail at this yeah like you're you're screwed he, he says actually as long as you have that you're safe but you would be relying on fortune for the nobles and the other thing is well going back to borgia um he kind of he says right so he's he's this weird example where he gets into power through the fortune of his his wealthy powerful dad uh, -huh. uh yes uses this like his virtue his this like manly vigor to go and conquer a bunch of stuff but then bad luck kind of unravels him at the end as well so i just don't ever underestimate that no matter how hard you try like this idea of fortune or fortuna will, will just it changes its course when you could least predict it and you can try and plan as much as you can and it's weird because borge is obviously cited as like he, he mentions i can't remember the exact quote but he basically says if there's one person who i could recommend to follow as an example it's this guy mm. And even he didn't didn't succeed. So yeah. uh, there you go. And he talks about this as well. Just to, before we move on to the next part of the book, he he talks about the election of a private citizen who you know who rises through the nobility and ends up being the prince. And it says, oh, what kind of problems might they face? They've definitely they've either got two things on the side. They've either got fortune or they've got like virtue of character. And so you shouldn't be too worried, especially if they've got the latter and they're ready to be to be flexible and in the light of the problems they might face. What we've done, we lay down this advice as Machiavelli does at the start of the book. He talks about Fortuna and the winds of favor and destiny that are unfolding. And we've also said that we should put up our sails ready to take, when this opportunity arises, you should, you can take fold of it. Imagine just like, imagine like a brilliant philosopher who spends all day in their room reading philosophy, right? And they think, oh, why can't I just like become a professional philosopher or something like this? Well, you need to actually put yourself in the situation. You need to kind of set your sail and put yourself in the place where you can, uh, where fortune might grant you some good luck. The, the key part there is that you need to have a certain disposition of character. You need what Machiavelli calls virtu. And Andy said a moment ago, it's like manly, manliness. It's like being <laughs> manly, manly. Yeah, so yeah. virtu, I mean, it comes... So just to be clear here, I mean, this will get much more into detailed analysis. But so vir virtue, the, the word that most people are familiar with, uh, obviously is it, like links into excellence of character and mm. usually of a moral disposition. Uh, so, you know, things like honesty and, and bravery and all of that stuff. And listen to our uh, episode on uh, Nicky Mackey and ethics. <laughs> yeah for all of that stuff about Good virtue. Good plug there, Andy. <laughs> um, 
But like when Machiavelli's using the word, I mean that the term like so virtu comes from via, which means kind of manly. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's got much more connections with that original root of the word as opposed to the kind of classical virtue of say Aristotle or Cicero, right? Um, so just be clear on on that. Was there anything else we're going to say? Manly, manly. Yeah, I want is that, is that. What it is? I guess what is virtu. Yeah, it's being. A, it's being. So the the Latin vir meaning man, opposed to homo, which means man or woman. Um, it's about being having these masculine qualities. A moment ago, I mentioned that fortuna is like the feminine thing, and Machiavelli thinks the masculine thing is the manly man is the vir, virtua, which is to control this and and. Like, I guess when I said it was erotic, he means like you should grab it by its sides and take take control of this thing of Fortuna, like as the manly man. And I guess we're using the phrase manly man. We should really say what he means by that. And I think in a phrase before we unpack it, I like to think of it as just be flexible. And, and the most um, noble leaders, the most virtuous leaders will be those who are ready to change their um their dispositions in the light of new circumstances yeah I, I kind of i mean there are so many words connected with it and i had a bunch of lists so one of the key ones that came up a lot is being like how like con in control of your own like your own arms whether that's like literally an army or like just like being in control of the situation mm. uh, and that like that's that itself is about as condensed as you can get, but like prowess, courage, like these mm. these things come up and up like time and time again when talking about this word virtue. And here, this this idea comes in in chapter fifteen, and in my note in the book itself, in my notes, I just wrote like this is where it gets good, like fine, like it, <laughs> like it was interesting. But this is kind of the meat. This is what people think of when they think of Machiavellian in the in the public consciousness. Yeah. Um. So just just quickly, but so before we move on to. Well, I guess I, I think we're all in agreement is probably like the good stuff. Uh, just just because we, we kind of jump from chapter to chapter uh, through one to 11 there. Mm. Um, so as like a very quick, like, like, what do we actually learn from those things then? So uh, just a summary of what we talked about. Basically, like we're concerned with new principalities, not just hereditary ones that are given to you. He says that like if you're going to do this, there are certain rules that you probably want to follow. Like obviously have control of your own army and not rely on auxiliary troops or uh, uh, missionaries. Uh, troops uh he's going to argue that you should befriend certain weaker people to have in your favor and get rid of the powerful ones as swiftly as you can to not be ultimately incredibly cruel but you to use cruelty wisely like say someone like cesare borgia as opposed to agothocles uh, and then he says that there are like w other ways in which you could gain your your power either like through so fortuna which kind of yeah ultimately a bit of luck through like the the civil people so either the people or the nobles uh or you can get it through like your own means which is ultimately the best way and oh and the final one obviously through like ecclesiastical but remember he says that that's the easiest one because god and then we're here at the end of this saying right so what is this for two what is it to be a great ruler um and what's the key message because that's just advice that i guess any a historian military leader could could give you at the time what's new and exciting about machiavelli is that he's saying that there's this different kind of idea of virtue that you need to have quote 65 uh, the gulf between how one should live and how one does live is so wide that a man who neglects what is actually done for what should be done moves towards self-destruction rather than self-preservation therefore if a prince wants to maintain his rule he must be prepared not to be virtuous and to make use of this or not according to need. Some of the things that appear to be virtues will ruin him. So if you want to stay true to what you think are like Aristotelian or Christian ideals of what it is to be good and virtuous, and remember Aquinas writes like the, the person who's in charge of the state should avoid earthly pleasures because their real kingdom awaits them in heaven. They should avoid power and honor and these things. Machiavelli's saying here, no, you want to abandon these virtues that was a problem with King Louis. It was the problem with, with the Pope. It's the problem with all those people we spoke about in part one. The common denominator they had, says Machiavelli, is they weren't flexible. They weren't prepared to leave their ethics first approach by the wayside. Yeah. And this is interesting, right? So you could you could even do like a really like mundane example of just, okay, so, you, you know, what, what do the people want from a ruler, right? So what, what do we want? Someone who's generous, who helps uh, the needy, you know, why don't, why doesn't uh, a new prince sell their possessions and give the money to the homeless, right? Of their, of their new territory. Well, 
that may be ethically speaking a really noble thing to do like a really good thing to do but it will put the prince in a weaker position because obviously he won't have his possessions he'll have less money from for himself and his rule so yeah machiavelli is really concerned about this balance right so he doesn't want you to be almost like completely selfless um, and give everything you have to others because that means you're making yourself weaker um, he's arguing that actually in, in certain situations, you know, you've got to stop doing good when a certain occasion arises. Yeah. So uh, a quote here from chapter 16, uh, generosity and parsimony. Uh, he says to, to main, maintain a reputation of generosity is essential to neglect uh, no kind of magnificent display. Consequently, such a prince will end up using up all of his resources in this manner and he will eventually be constrained if he wishes to maintain his reputation for generosity to burden his people with outrageous taxes yeah if you want to be this kind of like generous well-liked prince you have to be very careful because mm. to do that it, it just ends you in ruin and yeah okay yeah the, the natural thing would be yeah you'd have to raise taxes and uh, he says like the problem with that is is that you'll be hated even more so because people are used to you being this nice generous person person and the moment you start asking for more uh they will they'll kind of crack down on you mm. right like they get used to a culture uh, and they don't like it when you kind of go out of character as it were so yeah. it's best to start off slightly cruel and and frugal with your money and that ultimately that will lead to things like being able to pay for your own army which mm. he he praises uh louis uh, the king of france for that reason right like he he kept control in that sense and all of the military was funded through like i guess i, mean, I don't know how fair we can say his own means but he didn't have to constantly go back to the people demanding money from them and so retain power easier. Yeah, just quoting here from chapter 14 where he says, a ruler or a prince must have no other aim or consideration uh, than to seek the develop of any other vocation outside of war and the organization of the army and military discipline, physically preparing for war, especially during peacetime, and mentally preparing for war by understanding history will win and sustain power. Um, this middle section of the prince is it's, it's really into the uh, the war and the army. There's quite a lot of uh, there's quite a lot of army and war um, advice in it, um, and just this this worry and concern that Machiavelli has that Florence does not have a strong army hmm. um it doesn't have a, a, a people-led defense against invasion from the french or the spanish or other you know the papal states or, or wherever that it's vulnerable and he really stresses that as like one of the key kind of core like maxims of the book is just you need a strong army because without a strong army you can't have strong justice and you can't have strong laws and you can't defend yourself yeah good mm -hmm. so doesn't he say that you need you need two things strong laws and yeah. strong armies and you can't have the laws without the army so yeah, that's so the I'm most important gonna, yeah, thing yeah. so i'll only talk about the armies yeah and, and at the time it was very common and we've mentioned this before that you know people wouldn't fight just for their country you'd uh, have mercenary armies right where you'd hire people and pay them to fight for you and their only goal was to make money uh, from you or you would have armies from other places like auxiliary armies and that these were very undisciplined you know a lot of the people that would fight in these armies were just kind of quite self-interested and would plunder and take things that they wanted and he kind of argues or especially Machiavelli argues in the prince that actually no you need to get a really strong army it needs to be led by the people mm. um you know and kind of tapping into this like you know, almost like a sense of nationalism and pride like you need that and if you've got that you've got a strong army that you can kind of support and that benefits you and your your territory whereas if you're just depending on mercenaries for example once they're paid they're gone that they're not hanging around that's kind of really emphasized many times it also shows that trust doesn't it? if you arm your own people i think he mentioned somewhere that if you were to disarm them or something then it would show dis that they would distrust you uh, and that's that loyalty but again it's all contingent on whether or not your the people love you the quote i was trying to give earlier the best fortress that exists is to avoid being hated if you have fortresses and yet the people hate you they will not serve you so that still the most important thing here is to be loved by the people can we bring in here the the idea of being acting like a beast as well as a human or did you want to stop by somewhere else on the way to the machiavellian hotel uh no i, th I think that's that's fine uh, the one thing i wanted to bring up before we kind of gave that quote because it's probably one of the most it's famous the ones of, yeah. of the of the book is actually just to give it a bit of context so we've we've talked about the idea of classical virtue uh and and the writers who might have talked about that i mentioned cicero uh and uh it's interesting because this this passage of the prince is like completely 
a response or a, like almost like a play on the words of Cicero. Mm. So it's worth hearing Cicero's own words and then we'll hear what Machiavelli says. So this is from Cicero. While wrong may be done then in either two ways, this is by force or by fraud, uh, both are bestial. Fraud seems to belong to the cunning fox, force of, to the lion. Both are wholly unworthy of man, but fraud is uh, the most contemptible. So here we have Cicero talking about like how rulers should live. And he's basically saying like, you should never be untrustworthy and you should never be like the beast at all. And, and using like your power and your cunning is, is like a bad thing to do. And then we have Machiavelli coming in in this really classic uh, uh, phrase. As a prince is forced to know how to act like a beast, he must learn from the fox and the lion, because the lion is defenceless against traps and a fox is defenceless against wolves. Therefore, one must be a fox in order to recognise traps and a lion to frighten off wolves. Those who simply act like lions are stupid, so it follows that prudent ruler cannot and must not honour his word when it places him at a disadvantage and when the reasons for which he made his promise no longer exist. If all men were good... This precept would not be good, but because men are wretched creatures who would not keep their word to you, you need not keep your word to them. Ooh. Ooh. It's like a, we spoke about this in the car yesterday, didn't we? He's like doing a reverse cant here, isn't he? <laughs> Just like if all, like all people are corrupt and wretched creatures and therefore you should, you don't have to play this. Uh, it's like a reverse categorical comparison. You can act like yeah. them as well. well. Yeah. He's saying like a sensible ruler um, in a sense, uh, cannot and must not keep his words if it puts himself at risk i mean that's ultimately what it's saying right mm. um you need to be seen to be possessing these these virtuous qualities but actually e even if you don't have them like if, if, if it makes you more vulnerable you shouldn't do it um you've, you've got to play both of them at once you've got to you've got to kind of almost be aware of the way you are perceived mm. but actually always remember what your actual goal is it's like a facade and he, yeah. does, he carries on and the, the three pages after the three great quotes, he should appear to be compassionate, faithful to his word, kind, guileless and devout, but his disposition should be that if he needs to be the opposite, he knows how. Another quote next page, he should not deviate from what is good if it is possible, but he should know how to do evil. Lastly, everyone sees what you appear to be, few experience what you really are. It's, yeah. a, it's a show. Good. And uh, going back to uh, Cesare Borgia again, uh, this is this really interesting thing at the end of his life where, so Machiavelli throughout The Prince talks about how like, actually Borgia is kind of like what we just discussed there. Like he, when in private discussions, he was very private about his actual motives. He, he would kind of talk to people like Machiavelli, these diplomats, never quite giving them the full picture and then acting very swiftly and taking what he wanted. Mm. And then ironically, at the end, when he's talking to uh, Pope Julius II, is that he, I guess he just, or at least appears to be really naive in thinking that Julius, with all the promises he's making to, to Borgia, is being honest in his approach. And Machiavelli is basically like, think about what you've been doing to people for like the, the last five years. Mm. And do you not think for a second that somebody else might be as cunning as you? Uh, and the, in, in that sense, like, yeah, don't, don't trust the... Don't trust the, the like the other fox, right? Like if you're the fox, be aware that other people might be doing the same. Mm. I think we're going to labor on this point a lot in part four, but we should just put it in the moment now in, in the loader as we recognize this thing. He's doing what people at the time would refer to as political science. Um, he's being what we've referred to in the introduction as a political realist. He's saying you can't have these ethics first approaches and implement them on politics like a type of blueprint. Politics is messy. The real world always has some bad things done and we've mentioned the idea of virtue and and and, and machiavelli is different idea of this notion but think back to aristotle's a good doctor is one that heals a good boats craftsman a man that makes good boats what's good for the boat craftsman and the, and the doctor are two different things what's good for a ruler is one that can is different to what makes a citizen yes the citizen can be ethical but the ruler can't avoid this if they want to strive towards this power and honor before we finish this section we've missed out another great iconic quote um should we give it some context first uh yeah so uh, the we've we've covered the the fox and the lion uh and i think that the second most quotable line from machiavelli and the prince is about whether or not it's better to be feared than loved once again um interestingly enough that this is this is kind of another response to cicero not just cicero but uh, but other classical thinkers but um because he read cicero and this quote kind of links so nicely into it i would be amazed if machiavelli didn't kind of read this and think of this as he was writing the prince um so this is this 
by the way, is from Cicero, not Machiavelli. What I am more afraid of is lest, being ignorant of the true path to glory, you should think it glorious for you to have more power by yourself than all the rest of the people put together, unless you should prefer being feared by your fellow citizens to being loved by them. And if you think so, you are ignorant to the road to glory. For a citizen to be dear to his fellow citizens, to deserve the well of the republic, to be praised, to be respected, to be loved is glorious. But to be feared and to be the object of hatred is odious, detestable, and moreover, pregnant with weakness and decay. And just to be clear there then, so like there is some commonality in the mm. sense that Cicero says you don't want to be hated. Yeah. And Machiavelli agrees. Uh, but, he, but he's also really harsh on this idea of being feared. And Machiavelli, of course, has a very different take on this. Yeah, so to quote from chapter 17 of The Prince, where it says cruelty and compassion, whether it's better to be feared or loved, we've got the following. These reflections prompt the question, is it better to be f uh, f <laughs> That's an unusual word. Eh? Nice. <laughs> what translation have you got? <laughs> These reflections prompt the question, is it better to be loved rather than feared or vice versa? The answer is that one would prefer to be both, but since they don't go together easily, if you have to choose, it's much safer to be feared than loved. And he uses the example kind of earlier in the chapter of Borgia again, right? So this idea that Borgia it was, wasn't necessarily compassionate. Uh, I mean, to quote it directly, um, Cesare Borgia was thought to be cruel, yet his cruelty restored order to Romagna and united it, making the region peaceful and loyal. In certain situations, for a prince, for someone in charge, you need to be cruel. Mm. And that this cruelty at the start of your kind of reign, I guess you could say, yes, you may have to be more cruel than you want to be, but in the long term, thinking long term, that will create a more peaceful, loyal society. Um, in a word, before we start to wrap up the prince, Ollie, would you rather be feared or loved? I mean, would loved, yeah. Andy? Yeah, I would say, again, I would, loved is probably oh, nicer. Both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yes, because it's not completely the opposite thing. So Machiavelli, uh, coming towards the end of the book, carries on giving this, uh, the, the prince great advice for how they can maintain power and establish honour. A lot of the same points we've picked up earlier on. But it's chapter 25 where he really drums down on this idea of fortuna, of luck and of fatalism. And he essentially says that you can do all the, these things, but you still need luck on your side. And you need to respond to that when it comes with what we've spoken about is virtu. You, when it arises, you've got to be ready for it. You've got to put yourself in a position that the winds of fortuna are going to be able to pick you up and carry you to the lofty heights. But you need that wind to come along and that's out of your control. So there's a good degree, it's like a... It's a healthy degree of metaphysical honesty here, which says that, you know, I'm a determinist or a soft determinist, and it, but you all, so you need this as well. It's not like it's all down to you. Yeah, a bit of a safety net, I think, for Machiavelli as well, right? Because he's kind of saying, even if you do all these things, luck might not be in <laughs> yeah. your favour and it might not work. Um, but life's kind of like that to a certain extent, right? Like you, the, the amount of organisation bureaucracy and it would take to, you know, run an army, uh, you know, govern a state. Uh, sometimes things are famine, the weather, you know, uh, mm. things completely out of your control, sickness, disease, these completely affect a, a, a rule and a, and a government in a state. So, yes, I think he is kind of protecting himself a bit. It's been quite stoic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but I think he is also being quite pragmatic, isn't yeah. he? He's just saying sometimes it's just not going to work because there was a famine at that time and, you know, yeah. no one could eat. Well, like half the time, right? Like he, he says that like, like fortune takes uh, like you know, half of our fates to be decided and then the other half is kind of up to us. And uh, the whole the whole passage opens up with this idea of, OK, there's uh, this raging river and we could just let it overflow. But there are mm. things that a person can do, like, you know, building uh, walls and, and structures so that it doesn't destroy your crops or whatever. Um, and a couple of last little bits I just I highlighted as just being important from here. So uh, he says, uh, fortune is fickle. Uh, I believe also that the prince succeeds who adjusts his policy according to the nature of the times. Mm. And likewise, he is unsuccessful whose policies is at odds with the times. And then finally, therefore, since uh, fortune varies and men remain fixed in their methods, men are successful while the two are in accord. And when they are in disaccord, men are unsuccessful. One thing I'm certain of, it is better to be an impetuous than cautious for fortune as a woman. And it's essentially is in order to keep her under control, to beat her and attack her. Obviously, it's quite well, a lot more serious in this translation. Less, yeah, I know, right? more abuse than yeah, no, <laughs> eroticism yeah, you, in mine. Um, 
In which case, yeah, so it fortune in a way favors the brave, uh, but there are no guarantees there yeah. either. Um, and and obviously, if you can't change with the times, you're ruined. And that's where we mentioned earlier before, right? He like he has a massive go at Julius II for this very reason. Yeah. Like you're like, right, fine, you were impetuous. You kind of just took everything you could and lied to everyone you could. Uh, and you're just lucky that the time was yes. right for that. You could say... It's like epic. There's things inside your control, outside of your control. Focus on those in your control, and that's all you can do, right? And he's he's being very stoic there, isn't he? Let's hope fortune favors the brave as we jump into our game of mystery philosopher. And we're not playing mystery philosopher. We're carrying on about <laughs> Prince. Here's Andrew. Yeah. So the 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 final bit of the book. So we just said like he goes through this whole philosophical thing. Uh, he mentions a couple of things in which the like princes should be wary of and how they should act. So you should be like you should be able to lie. You should be able to be cruel. Be aware of fortune. Blah blah blah. Uh, and then he finishes off the book kind of the way he starts it by tying it back to the the Medici and saying, right now that you've heard all of these great things. Let's have a call to arms. There's not been a better time and God is in your favor. Everything looks great. He literally basically says, like, the stars have aligned for yeah, you, yeah. sir. Let's unify <laughs> Italy and create a strong state. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. We have seen unheard uh, of pro- uh, prodigies produced by God. The seas has o- have opened up. A cloud has guided you on your way. A stone has poured forth water. Manna has fallen here. Everything has come together for your greatness. <laughs> Guys, like, let's go invade Florence. Like, so yeah. I, I just love how, like, he, he's, like, championed as this... Uh, um, kind of really pragmatic guy, but he also has this kind of twinge of like he still has that bit of superstition, this yeah, yeah. like looking for signs that things are going like it- like Italy's way, and that he's basically saying to the Medici now, get rid of the barbarians, let's get rid of the French, let's get rid of the Spanish, let's get rid of the Germans, and unite Italy as this great nation I know it can be. That's, and that didn't, didn't happen. That didn't happen even today really I think you've, yeah, you've got our, you've got our listeners being like yeah let's do it we're, we're about 400 years yeah, 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 yeah. And even as people would debate Italy's not even necessarily very united today whoa no, let's not get too political Jeez, wow that was, that was my level <laughs> Italian unification course was it yeah <laughs> but like it's just not <laughs> sorry to all Italian listeners on behalf of oh, Ollie does not represent the views of the pants actually you do what? you fully do represent <laughs> yeah, the yeah, views. I do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he represents a third of the views Italy's united it's never it, been better. It's, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. it's definitely more united now than it was. Yes, yes I would say that, agree. but it's still it's still got its divisions, right? Okay. Mystery okay. philosopher. <laughs> that <a> segue. <laughs> Okay, so we have our final advertisement for Gus and Luger backpacks. You've still got the opportunity to win one over there. Ollie, do you, can you describe that backpack for us and how I'm much you're holding you... it right now? Well, it's it's like a nice olive green. It's got a lovely symbol with Gaston Luger, Stockholm, Sweden written on it. It's got lovely brown straps. Um, it looks like it can... If I'm honest, it doesn't look like it could carry too much, but whatever was being carried would be well protected as long as it wasn't raining or snowing or harsh weather conditions. No, I think it does sustain. It's weather resistant as well. It's a beautiful backpack. Uh, you said yeah. in the... Don't say that. It definitely <laughs> is. I've been using my... I've had mine on a serious note. I've had mine out in the rain and everything. It's been absolutely fine. And I, again, like I said last last week, I would never have another backpack again. Andy, what backpack do you have at home out of interest? Uh, I have no idea what I have, I'm afraid. You don't know? No. And branded? Yeah, I guess. Like it's It's like I got it like five plus years ago and i still use it you could do with a new one but i could do with a new one which i may win in this round well if you don't win you can use the discount code pan sign get 15 percent off your gas and luga backpack me and ollie were at uh the pub yesterday with you andrew but we just wrote this just before you walked in uh we want to thank gas and luca for your support we do massively appreciate it there's nothing machiavellian about gust and luca they're honest ethical and they won't invade your territory but they are very good at carrying stuff and helping you look good um seriously thank you thank you thank you please go and pick one up pansai is your discount go 15 percent off all items a links in the itunes description um yeah thank you again the mystery philosopher uh, so your mystery philosopher awaits gentlemen with your chance to win this backpack today and are you ready sure i can't Born remember ready. the quote and i'll probably get it wrong this time too those who wish to seek out the cause of miracles and to understand the things of nature as philosophers and not to stare at them in astonishment like fools are soon considered heretical and impious and proclaimed as such by those whom the mob adores as the interpreters of nature and the gods. 
But these men know that, once ignorance is put aside, that wonderment would be taken away, which is the only means by which their authority is preserved. Your guess is on three, two, one. Richard Dawkins. No. Thomas Hobbes. No, neither of those. Uh, the answer, because we're not doing... Um, we can't advertise again with them next week because we do have a deal with Gus and Luger and they have two weeks of advertising with us. So we're going to, uh, I guess it goes to a rollover, a new decider. So a new quote. And this time we're going to be doing fastest fingers. So the first one to raise a finger is going to be the person who guesses. Here's your second quote. Oh, that was Spinoza, by the way. Oh, right. Okay, okay, okay yeah, good. And, and your new quotation is as follows. Nothing exists outside his stubborn project. Therefore, nothing can induce him to modify his choices, and having involved his whole life with an external object which can continually escape him, he tragically feels his dependence. Even if it does not definitely disappear, the object never gives itself. The passionate man makes himself a lack of being, that there might be being, but in order to be, and he remains at a distance, he is never fulfilled. Whoa, okay, Andrew's uh, finger, I think it's finger like, finger uh, I because there are a number of people I think that could be. I'll, I'll go with Sartre. But it's not no. Sartre. Well, that's going to be my guess. Who? Um, uh, you've got gonna, a, Wittgenstein. It's not Wittgenstein. I was going to go either. with. Well, I mean, I don't care. And we'll, is, I was. Oh, you don't. You don't. Well, no, I can say like I'm happy to give another guess. Um, but, I think we'll yeah. leave the okay. mystery philosopher for next week. And again, we'll we'll play from the Gus Luca backpack. That's right. They've just thanks to you guys. You've got another week of <laughs> another advertising. Week of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)